Hi, uh, welcome to the Taste of Letters panel. I'm Noor Kamen. Uh, we have our panelists today, Salma uh, Seidi, uh, Charles Act, Mariam Buktor. Um, this panel is also acting as a launch event for Arab Lit Quarterly's uh, Summer 2021 Kitchen Issue, which I uh, helped guest edit. And we have contributors and translators of here on the panel as well. Um, to give you a little bit of information on the Taste of Letters and this panel, um, the Taste of Letters, uh, the title itself came from uh, an Emen Mercil uh, talk. Um, uh, in it, uh, Mercil reflected on the Taste of Letters in the alphabet soups commonly found in Canadian supermarkets. And she wondered what Arabic letters might taste like in a similar soup. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about food writing in and through Arabic and in translation. So we're gonna start with our panelists um, doing some short readings for you from um, ALQ's kitchen issue and from their respective works and from translation as well. So we're gonna start with uh, Salma. Salma is a food studies researcher, writer, and filmmaker. Um, she is currently pursuing a graduate degree in food studies at Boston University, and her research focuses on cookbooks of 20th century Egypt, as well as issues of identity and citizenship in the UAE through food. Uh, you can follow her daily journeys um, on food and research at Sofra underscore kitchen on Instagram, which is a beautiful, lovely platform. I really recommend that you go and, and follow uh, everything that she puts up there. Um, Salma, please take it away. Thank you so much, Noor. Uh, and thank you for the invitation to be part of this awesome panel. Uh, this is really exciting. And uh, I'm holding the issue that came uh, yesterday through my sister. <laughs> I bribed her to get me a copy from Dubai on her way. <laughs> um, but it's awesome. I just uh, read the email that it's uh, available in Egypt and Maghadi, so I'll definitely be checking the bookstore out. Um, all right, so I'm really excited to be sharing with you a few uh, words from my uh, essay, Tapa's Bitter Orange Jam, which um, I wrote in reflection to my grandmother's story and her relationship to um, home economics movement, as well as uh, Abdul Nasser and uh, Um Kalthum <laughs> in some way. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna start with the, the final section, which could give a good, um, maybe a good sneak peek into, um, into the essay. Uh, the section is titled My 15 Jars. Um, staring at the 15 jars in my fridge, I wonder what it would be like if they were sold in some rustic organic farmer's market and labeled, quote, Granny's Bitter Orange Jam, unquote, in English. It would probably sell like hotcakes, attracting more people than my best friends and husband who were clearly lacking in taste. Um, I take out the open jar and scoop a couple of spoonfuls into a saucer. I turn up the fire on the stove and toast my belleted bread quickly on both sides so that it, it's slightly charred by the flame. The smoky toasted bits of the bread are the best accompaniment to fresh cold cream. I pour my tea, Syrian zhurat, and put everything on a small tray, then head to the balcony. As I sit in a shady corner, dipping into the jam, while my cocker spaniel eyes every bit, I recall how impatient I was when eating all the oranges one by one inconvenienced by how I couldn't touch my phone with sticky fingers to check my notifications. Shred the peel very thinly so it's almost transparent, the recipe says. And shred and peel the oranges, I did, as well as the tip of my finger. And then I had to soak the peel for 12 hours, twice, and Google words and measurement from the recipe that are no longer in use. Have you ever heard of the Alexandrian Magur, Al Magur al Iskandarani? as we call it, and the Agana, or Agana, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Me neither, nor had my mother or aunts, but thanks to a friend, I learned they were both types of large, deep earthenware pots used for cooking and storing foods. This sent me deep 
deep down uh, deep down a rabbit hole on the use of pottery and its different types in old Egyptian cooking. While I do not have a Mabur or a, a Ghana, I own a large and beautiful earthenware birem with a lid in which I usually store clarified butter in which I put to work for this 24 hour soak. And so after soaking, re-soaking, straining, simmering, skimming and sterilizing jars, this gem making process made me approach Theta's memory in a slightly different light. Almost all my memories of her are while she's cooking in the kitchen, making beautiful creations that cater to every family's members' cravings and desires. Naturally, I grew up assuming that her relationship with the kitchen was nothing but a passionate hobby and that the immeasurable sum of hours she spent making food for her family was all out of selflessness. But reading through the cookbooks she left behind has given me a broader context to her life which situates her culinary experience in the heart of gender, political, social, and economic struggles. It is easy to over-romanticize our grandmothers and their food. And as we see everywhere nowadays with commercializing and marketing, the teta, grandma, nonna figure, yet their ties to food are often oversimplified in the name of generosity, selflessness, and unconditional love. Their experience is glossed over with a certain naivety and nostalgia that is divorced from the realities of her time. As if one can take any woman, any woman from any time, and her relationship to food and the kitchen would be the same universally. What I find, what I found between the lines of her cookbooks on the, on the back of, the, of her newspaper recipe clippings and in her collection of women's magazines are stories of the heavy expectations placed on women modernist aspirations and financial hardships. My image of her became much more complicated, nuanced in a way by her own struggle with making a family, maintaining a happy home and cutting corners to better save. But more than anything, it made me think of the person beyond her domestic duties, obligations and expectations, even if they were self-imposed. It made me think of her as a little girl receiving lessons on how to make steamed ginger puddings like countless other girls in the first half of the 20th century. I pictured her flipping through the cookbook, selecting which of those might impress her neighboring working wives as a way of proving that she too could be successful staying at home. It made me think of how she sat budgeting every month's groceries as the country's economy went spiraling downhill as it funded wars and unrealistic nation building projects. And in an unforeseen way, this jam brought me close, closer to an understanding of Egypt's story, a bittersweet one that I have returned to, to live and continue after my mother left 30 years ago. Today, as I sit savoring the citrusy preserve, I acknowledge the privilege I have, the ability to make choices as a woman. I have no doubt that she truly loved cooking. It would have been impossible to garner such a legacy in the kitchen if she did not truly have a passion for it. Still, I believe she might have, some, she might have been someone else entirely if it wasn't for external or these social factors. One thing remains true though, what she left behind of her life, including her recipes and her cookbooks amount to so much more than a reduced image of the grandmother. The greater part, the greater part of her life was heavily influenced by factors she did not choose. And it is in this quiet acceptance of the mundane, the ordinary, and the dull over what she could have been if things had been different, the real strength lies. The tiresome task of thinly and meticulously peeling the bitter orange jam, soaking its peel repeatedly for 24 hours, and cutting, juicing, straining, and sweetening something that is otherwise too sour and bitter to the taste over and over and over again. It is an, it is in, excuse me, it is an act of preserving, of sustaining herself and her loved ones through hardship and of finding some sweetness within her life when perhaps all she wanted was to heal Egypt's shattered hopes after Abdel Nasser and to sing on the radio with Um Kulthum. Thank you. Was that over six Thank you. minutes? <laughs> that was perfect. That was, that was perfect, Sanna. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for that. That was one of my, of course, um, uh, editing this piece and working with you on it was like one of the highlights of um, this issue for me, amongst other um, pieces, uh, as well so as much. the beautiful photography that I believe your 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 husband helped 
take, I think that was also just a highlight of that. So you definitely need to get an issue just so you can see the beautiful photos that go along with uh, this piece and all the effort that Sanma went to to find uh, bitter uh, oranges in basically springtime when it's really difficult to find just to make these this jam and take these photos. So, so much effort was put into this. Thank you. It's really my, my it, honor, Sanma. really, and my husband's as well. Thank you so much. Amazing. Uh, next up, we have uh, Charles. Um, Charles is a writer, culture manager, and architect. He writes tech articles and music reviews for Madamast and Naizif, and a number of short films, podcasts, and pop science videos. His published works include Food for Cops, The Undercommons, Red Like Orange, and Jellybird. I believe he's going to read an extract um, from Food for Cops for us today, translated by Ranya Abdelrahman. Charles? Yes, hello, and thank you for hosting. Uh, and thanks you, thank you for the lovely event. Uh, so can I give a short introduction to the book or, or just go on? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah so, so this book is, it is about food, but it's also not. We, we decided with the publisher, it's, it's just uh, the food here, it's just an approach to speak about many unspoken issues among politics and, and um, society and so on. And then with the publisher, Kotob uh, we decided to, uh, to make it look exactly like a cookbook. And even the description on the back, it says like here, uh, 120 recipe for making food and so on. So all this is just a joke. And then I, I, I hope it's a good surprise when someone buys it as a cookbook and, uh, and then it's nothing inside. So uh, I will be reading here an extract by, by Rania Abdurrahman, the translator, and um, she chose the, the the fourth chapter, Copts in Ramadan, uh, a study of Coptic school sandwiches or how to make the best chicken sandwich. Um, I'll try to, to make it short, but it's not very short. Uh, okay. Uh, in spite of their smaller numbers, Coptic Christians constantly make comparisons between the considerable influence of the Islamic diet on them and their influence on the Muslim family diet only to find that Muslim families, when the situation is reversed, are hardly affected by Christian dietary considerations, since those are, uh, aren't relentlessly and blatantly advertised in public spaces. The effect of this lopsided comparison is amplified in places where Christians and Muslims come together in an environment where a recurring food ritual take a place. The workplace, for example, in a, society, in a social setting where Muslims and Christians meet and where essential food rituals now and then occur. or uh, yeah, to get the caffeine or nicotine fix and practice the food ritual. Most of the time, the Copt will readily choose to adhere to Ramadan eating rules in public places. But if he feels the matter has been forced onto him or includes any element of compulsion, a psychological complex will begin to form and convert em emotional war will start inside of him. This inner turmoil might declare itself in a simple slip of a tongue or an argument. But if it's not released through a healthy outlet, it could escalate into a tactical long-term revenge plan, a plan that could affect the entire identity of Coptic Kitchen. And now let's turn to school, another env environment where Muslim and Coptic citizens mingle, but this time smaller sized ones. Every move this little miniature makes is determined by whims of their controllers who try to regulate their behavior and general etiquette at home and at school. But during the short half hour midday break, when the children enjoy some degree of freedom, most, in fact, nearly all of the strings that control each child's free will are released, except for one, the sandwich. During break, the sandwich is the only reminder of the child ties to home, and it is taken very seriously. Warnings and threats precede its handling, 
it's, it's handing over to the child and monitoring and surveillance follow. But it's not just a symbol of the child's submission to his family and evidence of his obedience. It's also a coded message. The sandwich makers, most likely the mothers, statement to the world. The type of bread, the filling, the number of sandwiches, all these are secret signs and symbols with which a mother determines her son's social hierarchy. So how can we even think about discussing Coptic food, its meaning, significance, and standing without taking a closer look at the Coptic school sandwich? The Muslim families at school didn't use to pay much attention to the, to the Coptic fast. First of all, the numbers involved were hardly big enough to attract attention. Secondly, Coptic fasting isn't blatantly noticeable. After all, fasting Copt doesn't refrain, refrain from food completely, as in the case with Ramadan fasting. So sandwich filling are in, immediately obvious as a comparative measure to be considered here. But to overlook them would be wrong because humans are based by nature and nobody can ignore the content of his colleague's sandwich. As soon as someone starts to eat the sandwich, a nearby person's exploratory senses will perk up and they will try to see, smell, and hear what the other person is eating. That's why when we're fasting, my mother's sandwiches making abilities and creative energy would shine and should come up with innovative fillings that kicked my sandwich up the top notch status. During the fasting period, the fool would be at its best. The stewed faba beans dressed up with, with snazzy trimmings like green olives or home pickled lemons. The falafel would be homemade and garnished with tahini sauce and push iceberg lettuce. Tuna would take a new dimension and importance and olives would be served in ways we wouldn't see again for the rest of the year and would assume foreign names such as tapenad is the French word. Um, new and unexpected ingredients would start showing up on the sandwich menu like eggplants in rich variety of options. Fried, mashed into a baba ghanouk dip or mixed with vegetables into what it's called monk's salad, which surprisingly makes the best of sandwiches. More vegetables would top the eggplant, including plenty of arugula and peppers. My mother would embark on cooking escapades, which due to her bold experimental nature often has unexpected results. This led to the creation of one of the most important sandwiches ever to have graced this world. One which many people found unusual at first, but grew to enjoy after tasting it. The fried artichoke sandwich with vegan mayonnaise. This concoction started out as an adventurous attempt to make a change, a break in our routine menu, but it was so good that my brother and I asked for it again and again, even when we're not fasting. With this magical combination, a new taste burst to life that had never before been tried in school sandwiches, but it wasn't strange or off-putting. There was a faint suggestion of a fried chicken about it because it tasted just as good, but it had its own unique flavor. It made you see vegetables in a whole new light, the crunchy outer layer, the rush of deliciousness, from the warm, soft inside, even hours after it was prepared, and the perfect harmony between the slight bitterness of the artichokes and the vegan mayonnaise. It was a peculiar amalgam of ingredients, each of which you, must, you might not necessarily enjoy on its own, but it attracted the curiosity approval and approval of everyone who tasted my sandwiches at school, which, the, which they did in tiny measured bites. This should give you an idea about sandwiches situation during our fast. As for their fast, the Ramadan fast, that was a delicate affair. My brother and I, and most of the Christians I know at school, used to feel slightly embarrassed to eat our sandwiches in front of our fasting colleagues. At first, we tried taking sandwiches with us and eating them shamefully in dark corners around school, but we soon felt that this could drive others away from us and we didn't want to commit any strange or extreme act that might fray the national tapestry of life. So we decided for the most part to fast Ramadan also. Our parents disapproved initially, but our insistence eventually gave in to what we wanted. Even though they did the same themselves at the workplace, they'd hoped their sons and daughters would raise the revolutionary Christian flag, which they hadn't had the courage to hoist themselves. 
They used our young age as excuse, saying we wouldn't be able to stand the long hours of hunger and that we had biological justification and advantage that would make the constant comparison work more in our favor. For we follow their fast, but they don't follow ours. It has always been us and them. I hope it was well, not too you. long. No, no, not at all. That was perfect. Thank you, Charles. I am excited to talk about uh, this extract and your book and the artichoke sandwich, which I'm very eager to try myself or make my mom make so I can try. Same thing. Um, next up, we have um, Mariam. Mariam is a writer, translator, curator, and researcher based in Egypt. She is interested in medicine, food, and bodies. They are part feline and sing sometimes. Her work has been featured in The Outpost and The Must, in addition to the Contemporary Image Collective. And I believe Mariam, Mariam also worked on um, translating the taste of letters texts. Uh, and I believe she's going to read uh, a couple of her translations. Go for it, Mariam. Hi. <laughs> uh, should I talk about the workshop a bit first, or are we going to do yes, that? Yes, please. Later? OK. Uh, no, no, go ahead. So basically, the, the text I, I'm going to read now is um, from a, a collection uh, of texts that were produced uh, in 2019 uh, during the Taste of Letters uh, workshop. Uh, I believe Noor has already mentioned where the, the name came from, but uh, basically the point was to uh, produce more uh, personal uh, writing about food, uh, especially from the perspective of women, since like, as we can see from the two previous texts, and usually they're the ones doing all the labor of uh, making food. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and uh, start reading. Uh, the text is by um, Iman Abdul Hamid Kamil. And it's called uh, How I Cook Love in Three Steps. Uh, and uh, translated by yours truly. The same place that was a stage for my culinary adventures now reminds me of the straightened dimensions of my existence with its wet that does not exceed roughly a meter and a half, and its height is barely three meters, which has to hold all the appliances, utensils, and pots my mother bought in preparation for my marriage. So she could rest assured that she had fulfilled her maternal duties. I don't remember choosing the plates or the pans. Back then, I was fighting other battles. I didn't know I had it in me to care about such details. Now, I know I do. I not only have to concern myself with all these details, but I also must develop a capacity for appreciating them. I can't deny that I have grown fond of certain items, the plates for Chinese noodles, the precision of the coffee cups, but there is an excess of things to choose from adding to the state of perplexity and even more to the state of congestion. I pull my mind back from regurgitating all these thoughts, reminding myself of the task at hand. My feet hurt from standing under this miserable weight and my hands want nothing more than to escape the unbearably sticky dish soap sensation. Something this heavy cannot be a meditative ritual. I have to wash the rice until the water is translucent, then soak it for at least half an hour. They say this will rid the rice of starchiness. Perhaps I'll defrost the meat in the microwave as I seem to be running out of time. So the dinner menu for today will be rice, beef, and sauteed vegetables. But stop, he doesn't eat sauteed vegetables and he doesn't like vegetable salad a pet peeve carried over from his childhood. What side dish can I serve that conveys nutritional value as well as affection? This hesitation stirs some pent up anger, bringing it to the surface. I don't approve of his eating habits and his appetite for everything unhealthy. When I tell him this, he tells me that love is about acceptance. I need not approve of his choices 
and it's okay if I don't, but in any event, it's no reason to be angry. Deep down, I know this to be true, but I can't always find a reason for my perpetually boiling anger. He tells me that he needs a warm meal every day, a reason to want to come home. Every time we have this conversation, my sobbing gets out of control. I pretend to be strong, to have it all together, taking in deep breaths and exhaling them slowly. But I can't help but break into silent sobs until I start choking on uncontrollable tears. In that moment, all I want is for everything to stop, for all the sobbing to cease, for the load to become a little lighter, for the river of anger churning in my chest and threatening to drown me to let up just a little. Of course, this never happens. I can't just allow myself to cry and leave off our ping pong game of blame and shame. Each one of us blames the other for the hardship we suffer alone disappointment for failing to meet the unrealistic expectations we set for one another. He becomes my opponent and I am swift on the offensive. My guard is always up to shield me from any impending enemy attacks, but he is not my enemy, far from it. The uncertainty makes me uncomfortable and my troubled soul wants nothing more than stillness as if someone had thrown a rock into my motionless lake. I need a side dish to go with the white rice, something that's not vegetables or a salad, something soft to coat my hard-hearted, thorny love. He isn't too crazy about red sauce, but he likes it with feta. That inimitable dish, the one people gather around during feasts, which is also prepared during periods of mourning, to comfort those who have lost a loved one. It's coincidentally one of his favorite foods. His mother recently shared her particular recipe for fatta. Fatta it is then, for today's serving of love. For now, the creases on my forehead, my face's reaction to an impending migraine will be set aside, along with the pains in my back, which my mother attributes to my laziness and weight gain and that a book I'm reading explains as a symptom of evading the weight of responsibility. There is no more time for cathartic sobbing, nor for changing the mismatched dreary outfit I've been wearing at home all day. I have to make some love. I get out beef, around 300 grams. I cut the meat into medium-sized cubes, taking care to remove all the fatty bits, just the way he likes it. I put a nonstick pan on medium heat. To the pan, I add a spoonful of butter and some oil. As soon as the butter melts, I gently add the pieces of meat, make, making sure the oil doesn't splatter and burn my hands. A sprinkle of salt and pepper on the upturned side. I wait for three minutes or maybe five, then flip the meat over and repeat. The noise in my head stops. I watch the meat change color. <laughs> Thank you, Mariam. Um, as, as Mariam mentioned, uh, that text was uh, the result of a workshop that uh, Mariam, myself, and uh, my Panaga helped uh, build and facilitate at the Contemporary Image Collective. And a man's piece always, it always gets to me. It's always so powerful just whenever I reread it. So thank you, Mariam. Um, now we're gonna have like a little discussion, some questions. If you're watching right now and you want to ask any questions, please do send them over uh, and we'll get to them towards the end. Um, so one of the things I, I really do wanna talk about with all of you and feel free to like jump in and answer um, is the fact that women and their roles in the kitchen come up again and again in each of your pieces and each of the texts that you just shared. And in, in the kitchen issue as well, like we have the image of grandmothers, mothers and women who are not only like cooking and making food and doing that care labor, but also kind of sustaining 
culture and rituals. And so I'm really interested in how a lot of these texts end up being very personal, like almost um, personal narratives, confessional narratives, like self reflective in a way, um, more so than we have like, you know, fiction or poetry. I feel like there's like a, a trend in writing and in Arabic writing of uh, food, uh, talking about food or describing food or writing about food. So we have our, our resident culinary researcher as well who can, who can weigh in. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand, <laughs> like, uh, what, why, why is it? I, I think, I think, I think my, my question is why do we, what is like food is so, so personal that we, we only, we tend to write about it or the growing trend is to write about it from personal perspectives. And that seems to be like the, the amount of texts that kind of are produced tend to be very um rather than fictionalized they tend to be drawing from reality and the personal um i i think it's sort of coming from i think that we're in a moment generally where uh, a lot of writing has become personal writing um yani i'm i think it has something to do with just like how we consume media okay but I also think it's uh, yeah, and it's it's now is like sort of the time for writing personally, and there's also a lot of um, it's giving voice to a lot of experiences which didn't really uh, have a voice before. Yeah, um, this um, I want to hear what everyone else has to say. And yeah. Um such an interesting question. I think what Mariam touched on is, um, and what also you said, Nur, that food is extremely personal. Everyone has has a relationship to food, you know, whether it's literary or not. Um, but I think what's specifically interesting in, you know, in the region um, and in Arabic literature, I feel, but also generally, I think it's also a global trend of food memoirs, writing food memoirs and, um, you know, reflecting on one's own heritage in one way or another. Um, and perhaps it is particularly, um, you know, um, attractive in our region, maybe because our own culture is more of a, an oral culture when it comes to the kitchen and, and recipes, collection of recipes, um, acquiring recipes from a grandmother to daughter to granddaughter is usually a very oral heritage, one that you might not necessarily find written or documented somewhere else. Um, so I think there's, there's a big appetite <laughs> Uh, pun intended, um, for, for that to delve into what I like to call this personal alternative history that is otherwise not found in textbooks or in, in uh, you know, uh, um, and again, I might be talking from um, the perspective of my own family uh, relationship or the, you know, the woman in my family's relationship to food which could either be um, taken through the, you know, home economics track and their own, you know, the older generation relationship to food, which just uh, would seem to be just cut somewhere in the middle, you know, uh, after they stopped using those textbooks and then it just became diverted more towards an oral culture and, and heavy influence from media as well and television and radio and all that. Um, and a lot of things go undocumented and unwritten. Um, and a lot of personalization in the kitchen as well in our culture, you know? There isn't specifically a said recipe for certain foods. Uh, every woman or every household has their own touch touches and, you know, um, a 
a spoon here, a pinch there, uh, like they say, you know, very, um, how would you translate Bilbaraka here, Mariam? <laughs> And you might have to niche on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a difficult one, yeah. Uh, like like then, a like a dash like a dash of a blessing, like a touch of a blessing, yeah. Like you're, you're blessing the food, yeah. You're blessing, blessing the, food the food with a touch, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So yeah, perhaps perhaps that's why maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's it's also the type of art that everyone practices. So it's, it doesn't need a special education. It's it's very embedded into the culture with the with the very wide of the the, the meaning of the word culture. Mm -hmm. So ev every single one has has their personal experience with trying to cook and of course trying food, and therefore the everyone has their very personal experience. And unlike any other art where there is always a higher form of practice, like for example, if we talk about music, there is always the the rock star or or the the best at the game or the best at the business. In 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 food, it's the the best is always very personal. It's simply the the home food, the the home taste. It's it's very changing of one's DNA and 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 feelings that it turns just. It, it turns to the norm and anything that is good is it's good because it resembles the the home cooked food in in some way yeah i i definitely agree and, and get what you're saying that that sense of um like almost like nostalgia it's like it doesn't necessarily have like the food doesn't necessarily have to be good but if it reminds you of something you're like this is excellent this is the best thing i've ever eaten <laughs> even though it's not technically um, the best the best food. Um, I'm really interested in, in that that the idea of like documentation as well and how we're like, yeah, the idea of documenting and Charles, you do this in, in your book as well. It's like an act of not necessarily like, like you said, not documenting recipes, which I'm I'm curious to know why you chose not to include the moral, but also like documenting the importance of like food and culture and history. And I think in in terms of Egypt, the majority of the population doesn't know a lot or doesn't care to learn or find out a lot about Coptic traditions, especially like around food. So, I mean, I, you know, love to hear more on that. Uh, I want to say something about, uh, about recipes. Mm -hmm. I always, when I search for a recipe, at, uh, at any website and there is always this introduction of any recipe and it's so boring and so useless of, of like trying to be a kind of literature but it's not and and it's it's always there in anything that you would search search for how to fry fries or, or whatever and they will, will give you this introduction of fries is one very healthy uh, vegetable and we always like it and so on and and this is the the most boring part of when you read about recipe because you you want to go into the bones you want to to know what's what's important and in the literature is is the exact opposite it's not the the recipe you're looking for you're looking for all the ornaments around it and all the experience around, around it and and your own take of the writer's take around it and not actually the recipe the the recipe would be the most boring part of it Hmm. I do want your yeah. uh, artichoke recipe, though, I, I, Charles. I was gonna... <laughs> Please. <laughs> I, was gonna say... <laughs> I like. I agree with you because when I do look something up, I, I do skip the introduction and go straight to the recipe. But I still want your mom's artichoke. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I'm sure she'll um, be very happy to to share this. I, I don't know where which she did the, the, she she brought it from. It's just. I think it was just experimentation and then it led to this somehow or maybe from this uh, famous uh, TV pr presenter what was it called uh, Mona Aymer she was mm -hmm. the the one who rev revolutionized the cook program cook for, yeah the cook program in in the Egyptian TV yeah. and I'm sure that that either she was experimenting or it was a perfectly Mona Aymer recipe 
We'll have to, Sunla, you'll have to dig into it and find out more. Yeah. Find out the history of this pride artichoke. On my sandwich. list now. Mm -hmm. Good, good, I'm glad. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I do want to ask is, like, again, coming back to, like, documentation and, like, cookbooks and trends in, like, where we get recipes and ingredients is, um, so, like, we like we're constantly consuming like new media and like especially with social media you can kind of go through and, and find like a recipe for anything and, and see all these different things is how we not just in food but also in our our writing how it affects our writing about food how we take things and then kind of incorporate them into our food so for me like the one example i came up with was how uh red velvet cake kind of came over here and became this like big deal and now you can find red velvet anything you can find like red velvet kunefa and it's just so far removed from what it originally was and like the history of that food but we've almost like taken it and given it a different life and a different story now um i think that's that's i don't know something i think about a lot is how we take take something and like reform it into something that resonates with us Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, and it's funny you mentioned that because <laughs> I, I particularly see it during Ramadan with all these insane food creations or recreations or appropriations, whatever you want to call them, right? Um, but people do get perhaps more playful when they fast. <laughs> Is it fantasizing about food? It, it gives you, it pushes your limit, right? It pushes your uh, creativity in a way, but also... Um, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I think, uh, Nani, it also has to do with how, yani, these in this day and age, Bordeaux Egyptians are immigrating at bigger numbers than they ever did in like their history. Yeah, and starting the 90s, I guess, up till the 2000s, you have a lot of people who are like moving to the Gulf, which has like influences obviously from the UK or the US and then there's like the diaspora in the US and Yanni I feel like it was a big thing in the 90s for someone to go to the US and like come up with this uh, thing that wasn't previously uh, available in Egypt and then and Yanni I feel like that sort of became a trend well, Ramadan yani, is the time when people buy the most sweets, so <laughs> I guess it would make sense. Um, but so I feel like it has something to do also with like immigration and globalization, as you were talking about, like with all of these cooking shows uh, when uh, Feta Feet, like the first uh, sort of uh, channel on the Shpakra was on Nile Sat. Uh, I think, um, but uh, I think it was the first time like uh, Egyptian audiences were exposed to cooking shows um, that weren't like Egyptian or uh, from the region. Uh, and I feel like that also influenced people's tastes yeah, or like their willingness to sort of incorporate other uh, flavors and red velvets we could I'm sure in two years people will be discussing oh, what's the origin of uh, red velvet kunafa and and people will assume it's completely Mediterranean and some would say no it's uh, Italian and so on but that's how, how it happens with, with everything I, I I was shocked to to know also uh, just recently that kushari is has in, is is very oh. recent actually in in the history it's not that that old like in its form that we, that we know now, it's very recent and it's never Egyptian. It's always something that is added up on every other house. And then it just reached this phase that, that we know and, and see now only 40 years ago or something. Yeah. I was just Definitely. thinking, sorry, go on. <laughs> no, no, I was, just, I was just adding to Salma's uh, idea that definitely hunger plays a role in, in uh, fantasy and, and uh, creativity, definitely. Yeah. What are you going to say, Mariam? 
No, I was just thinking as well, like the kinds of new foods that are introduced. Um, yeah, and you both do have something to do with like which uh, countries are more dominant. But I feel like now we're also seeing an influx of like Asian food uh, in Egypt uh, and things from Singapore and uh, like this Japanese cheesecake is now being sold in shopping malls. Uh, I feel like it's this weird mix of like where people are uh, have been traveling because like there's a lot of trade masan, happening with China uh, and with Asia masan. and also like uh, someone might have seen a video on YouTube of like Japanese cheesecake and decided that they want to like open a shop I think that's that's what I'm talking about these trends of like because media and like we love devouring literally and pun intended media about food and like food is one of those things that you can make you can see it you can see someone making something in Japan and be like well I can get all these ingredients and I'm gonna make Japanese pancakes here in Egypt like you can do that um and I think that is what's so like interesting to me about food and, and like that line of like well when when does it become like appropriation and when does it just like because I, I, the history of Egyptian food as I said I can tell you is just the mixing of things like kushri itself is like a mixture our kushri Egyptian kushri is a mixture of like Italian pasta and like Indian lentils and like we have and then like it's just it becomes this this new thing and so yeah who is to say that if we someone sees like a TikTok of Japanese pancakes but then you know adds uh, an Egyptian twist to it is that's is that fusion or is that a whole new Egyptian dish kunefa yeah it's like red velvet kunefa it's like well, you know so I think that's what in, intrigues me so much about food and what we do with food yeah absolutely Oh, like uh, you, like the thing you said about Italian pasta, but it reminded me of like when a lot of Egyptians would go to Italy to work and then return and open a pizza place. So uh, this is also like yes. something you find a lot, like pizza and fatir. And there's always like the story of this man who went to Italia like ages ago and then came back, and and there's like this running joke that all like the pizza places in Italy are also managed by Egyptians yeah. Egyptians, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Destroying pizza worldwide. <laughs> <laughs> the real history of pizza is, is Egyptians. We've taken it over. Yeah. Uh, we have a couple of um, audience uh, questions so I'll ask you. One of them is for Charles. Um, does the fact that food is so personal and that there aren't the great superstars of food making like there are for music or sports change how people write about food. And obviously everyone can answer this as well. Yeah, definitely. That, that's why it's a, it's a very personal experience. You, you, have, you have your hero at home. So you're, you're very much involved into the ritual and, and all the steps of, of doing the food and you know how, where, where it's bought from and where it, where the vegetable grew and at at a part of uh, at another chapter of the book I'm, I'm speaking about this idea that that the more you're involved into the making of food the more you appreciate it and and you you kind of can trace where every taste is from and yes that's the taste of water or and that, that has been I don't know and and you can train yourself more to understand where every taste came from. Um, so the, the more you're involved in, the, in into the, the steps, the making is very important to, to learn about, to train your senses to food. Yes, that's uh, very true. Do we have any other questions? We do, we do. Uh, another question is, what is the relationship between food and travel or food writing and travel writing? Which I think is a very, a very good question. And I, I think that was, I'm gonna answer, not answer, answer, but add my two cents. Um, which is that before we had, we like had like TV and social media, like 
travel writing and food writing were almost the same thing. Like people traveled around and noted down the like recipes and, and food habits of other people. And that's how we got, like, I would say was one of the ways that we got food writing. So that's, that's my two cents for this answer. Yeah, I would say, just to jump in quickly on this, um, as a researcher, one of the best resources that we have historically to dive into and find out about, you know, food um, scenes or uh, food, uh, food ways of certain regions is through uh, geographers, like early geographers who traveled around and describing what they saw um, and that tend to be tend to be the, the the most richest descriptions of food that we ever have. Um, and it's it's they're extremely generous. And of course, it depends from one you know writer to the other. But and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't specifically their uh, agenda to just focus on food, but more of just the scenes describing this uh, different ways of living. Um, that really existed back then. Uh, so historically, it has always been done. Uh, so there's definitely a, a, an immense tie between this uh, sense of discovery and, and food because it is one of the key ways that one can find uh, about a way of life that is that is different or it's visible to us when we visit somewhere else, you know? Um, I, I feel like that's also kind of, uh touches on uh, what you were saying about hunger like if someone is uh, traveling somewhere like they want <laughs> they just want <laughs> they want to know what they're going to eat yani, and they're like oh just the idea of like yeah and just to add to what you were saying this not just like uh not just how when you're discovering a place like your senses are sort of activated and food is, and like cooking is one of like the ways that would activate that but also um i feel like you can tell a lot about a culture just from observing like how people eat do they all eat from the same plate or do they like uh is it just like everyone eats individually from their own plate uh do they use their hands or not um yeah i feel like it's uh it's something that that also like because it's so personal it, it just kind of reveals a lot as well about people uh and how they behave or how they relate to each other uh, uh yeah so absolutely yeah <laughs> and so to add to that it, it tells you about trade as well the relationship to their governance or their you know system of any rules that govern the societies that they live in um yeah but i'll just stop there i could <laughs> keep on talking forever about this <laughs> That is literally why you're here, Sanma. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't censor yourself. <laughs> well, how much time do we have anyway? <laughs> we got we have six minutes. We got a couple okay. of uh, a Let's couple more, more questions. questions. Yeah. Yeah. I'm please don't 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 cut yourself short. Like rant. It's okay. This is a safe space for ranting. <laughs> um, I have a question for Mariam in translation. Um, are there any particular challenges in translating writing about food? Um, yes, <laughs> uh, I think the I think the main uh, thing that I noticed this time was uh, this question of like keeping the meal name as it is, or um, like yani aloha in transliteration zayfatta, for example, or trying to come up with like another meal name and I feel like because yani, wh when you are reading it in the original language خلاص, someone says fatta immediately like you know what they're talking about this uh, and and it, it has like very um, uh, intimate to personal associations for every different reader uh, whereas if when you're translating you're 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 also like introducing something new that the reader has no associations with um and by you're also trying to give like a bit of uh, context uh one of the texts that we read actually during uh, the workshop because i was just like 
looking over the texts before the session, uh, was talking about also uh, like cooking as an act of translation in itself. Um, and they were talking about like this uh, Chinese woman who had recently immigrated to the US like after World War II and there was like hostility towards Asians, blah, blah, blah. Uh, anyway, and, um, the woman like wrote the book, uh, she came up with all the recipes and her daughter who was more integrated in American society translated uh, the titles of the recipes and then the dad, uh, the husband, uh, like renamed the dishes to, to make them sound more Chinese. So um, I feel like it's it's something but, but that like no two translators are gonna like have the same opinion on. But uh, I think the the thing that struck me the most was like this uh, how dishes just have like these names that don't necessarily mean anything. They just like have acquired meaning over the years, and that's uh, it's hard to translate without like adding footnotes or explaining more. Uh, and even then, like it's just. Yani, if you've never had fatta before, you're like not gonna know. Yani. <laughs> um, yeah, or like the the, the levels of which it's like normalized. So like, you know, if we think back way back when in the day when sushi wasn't the commonly used like term that we have now, like what, you know, you know, back in the day, I'm sure they were just like, this is a piece of rice with a bit of like raw fish on top. It's like, well, we've, we've now normalized that word sushi to the point where everyone knows what sushi is. And in that same way, it's like, how many how many times do you write or translate the word fatta before or have enough fatta recipes out there on the internet before you're like, yeah, this is what fatta is and everyone knows what that word is like, or molokheya, which sometimes if you try and look up a recipe for like molokheya, you get like Egyptian stew recipe or Jews mallow recipe instead of because it's still like not as commonly translated or used or like yeah. understood outside of like our our context so yeah there's like a lot of explaining that happens or has there's to happen explaining definitely um also like an another thing that i did honestly like when translating this uh, the piece that i read in particular um because she was kind of going back and forth between personal writing and between uh like a recipe uh i would look at how like uh, recipe language you know how like recipes have a very specific language and it's it's very different yeah. from arabic than from english <laughs> the thing that we just like discussed um yeah, and if you convention and things that you do in the kitchen that are also like very culturally specific. Yeah. But it's it's uh it's one of those I require things. much more explanation. Yeah. Or in translation. Yeah. I think we're probably gonna be kicked off in a second. I think we've reached um the end of our time, so that's why I wanted to jump in and be like. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful discussion. Thank you for answering these questions. Thank you everyone in the audience who uh, asked questions and came and, and listened. Um, I th yeah, thank you all so much.